Your support helps us bring you programs you love. Go to wyomingpbs.org, click on support, and become a sustaining member or an annual member. It's easy and secure. Thank you. In Wyoming, July 10th, Statehood Day is a day to remember. And this past July 10th, Wyoming celebrated its most important building with a grand reopening of the State Capitol Building and a day-long celebration which included speeches, a ribbon cutting, music, and fireworks in Cheyenne. The Capitol Complex celebrated next on Wyoming Chronicle. Funding for this program was provided by the members of the Wyoming PBS Foundation. Thank you for your support. I'm Craig Blumenshine from Wyoming PBS. As we begin this special Wyoming Chronicle, we wanted to share with you a special Our Wyoming on the Capitol Complex. Our Wyoming is a primarily digital only series that we produce here at Wyoming PBS. But as we remember the Capitol Complex celebration, we thought you would enjoy it as part of this Wyoming Chronicle. We are sitting in the room uh, where the first government in the world gives women the right to vote. Nowhere else in the world. This is it. It's not only important to Wyoming and not only important to the country, this is important to the world. This very spot where we're sitting right now. And when I walked in and I saw the grandeur and how well it is done, it gives you goosebumps. I mean, this is a very, very historic place. And now when it is redone in this way at this level, it's appropriate to show it off to the world. My name is Tony Ross and I am chairman of Capital Oversight Committee, which is in charge of the complete renovation of the Capitol Complex, including, most importantly, the Capitol. It started a long time ago. Probably we started saving for this in 2003. And then along the way, we made some appropriations to it. The first is just the nuts and bolts of why we needed to move forward on this. This building had been renovated, but not fully renovated. But there were things that were left undone that needed to be done immediately, in my mind. You know, the fire suppression system there was non-existent. Uh, it was not ADA compliant. So I think those were two immediate needs, but of course it's, it's much more than that. I mean, this is the most important building in my mind in, in Wyoming. And it represents not just government, but it represents what the state of Wyoming is all about. And it needed refreshed and it needed redone. One of the great aspects that has uh, really been emphasized by the group that has worked the Oversight Committee and others that have had a lot of care about this is the emphasis of the history and the continuity and the way to move forward. Of the project, the capital is $116 million. There are so many other components to the project. You've got Herschler at $57 million, and the CUP, the Central Utility Plant, at $19 million, the Connector at $19 million, and uh, you know all of your exterior stuff uh, at $8 million. Then you also got furniture, fixtures, uh, and equipment, and you've got uh, temporary leasing. That's all in the project. So when you really, if you boil it down, it's not $300 million just for this capital. It's for the whole capital complex and moving people around the city, finding places where we can house agencies while we're uh, doing this. Um, so that was a big deal. There's, there was challenges along the way because you have to figure out where you're gonna put everybody. Government offices were housed all over Cheyenne and there was a discontinuity uh, over the last several years. At times you're wondering what's the solution and we were very lucky that we were able to kind of fall into the Herschler. Turned out to be a, a, rather miraculous what we've done. Central Utility Plant was out of date. The boilers were way over their extended life and there was no efficiencies to them. It's now state of the art and it supplies cooling and heating for five different buildings. The Herschler Building and the Connector, the Capitol, the Supreme Court, the Barrett Building, and the Hathaway building. 
are all uh, tied in to the central utility plant. I think the initial thought about revamping the capital came about at a time when the state was pretty flush. We had a lot of energy resources coming in and luckily we had the fortitude to continue through and do the construction that was necessary to bring this building to fruition. I was the primary sponsor of the legislation. It was Senate File 103. When we started the project, we had, we had saved $100 million. We had the money to go forward, and then, of course, the economy takes it in the shorts. Ultimately, I had to make my own decision whether this was something that uh, needed to be done. The timing always is tough because we were coming off some good record revenues and, and we had money, but we also recognized being uh, you know, so mineral dependent that that could fluctuate and in fact it did fluctuate. So I had resolved in my mind that there was a definite need. I knew it was going to be tough. I didn't quite know how tough it was going to be, but uh, I thought, you know, if I have uh, a chance to do this while I'm governor, It'll be something that uh, when done, I will be proud of, that I had a, a role in uh, that uh, made this building even more magnificent. You know, we had a lot of good people helping us, everybody professional and with the best of intentions, but it was such a massive project. And what we lacked was the great expertise of who has done this, who has managed a project of this magnitude, not just square footage, but an actual capital. And, and that was MOCA they changed the paradigm of the whole project because they had done other capitals. And so they represented us as just layman legislators and to, um, to make sure that we got this project done right. They brought it all together and they showed us where we had made mistakes. Uh, they showed us a direction forward, how to manage the budget. And, and so we wouldn't be here today without MOCA. It's important that we retain the heritage and the significance of this building for our, uh, our children and our grandchildren. We recognize this is a chance to do this that won't come around perhaps for another 50 or 100 years. And we hired an artisan from New York, Evergreen, who's done historic renovations of capitals. And they were able to uncover the original colors and the um, ceilings and what they what they look like. Everything was down to detail. And now, when you, it all seems to blend. The skylights make sense. The colors are so much more grand. Uh, the gold leaf uh, that was covered up is back. Um, and when we start hanging our art, it'll even be more beautiful. Well, I think as we open this building, that's certainly a couple of us have felt strongly that the people of Wyoming need to understand what the investment truly was. Uh, you know, just as I said uh, before we began this project, more than just the rocks and the paintings, this is about the people. Uh, this, this reconstruction is, is, is really now more than just the edifice. It's the superstructure that brings us to modern standards with uh, internet and wired, wireless connections uh, with better plumbing, with ADA accessible bathrooms and, and, and all of that. When you look at the fundamentals, first of the, just the life safety issues that needed to be rectified, but secondly was public access to their government. And literally they did not, the public did not have meaningful access to committee rooms, to committee meetings, and then I think the practical usage of this building is going to be greatly enhanced because the best government is government that is open to the people and allows for their full participation. And the way it was designed uh, before this renovation, it didn't allow for that full participation because some of the meeting rooms were so small and people couldn't get in and ask the questions and hear the debate. We, we've rethought government to make sure it's more accessible, it's more open, uh, and more transparent. And this building really represents all of that. There is something magical about this building. When you come to work in this building, uh, you, you have a, a depth of uh, sort of the history 
and, and the expectations of the people of Wyoming that Wyoming uh, will move forward. I hope they have a great sense of pride in their uh, state house, in their capital, and also a great appreciation for the utilization that allows for full participation by the citizens in their government. The festivities on July 10th began in earnest just afternoon with speeches from Governors Mead and Gordon and Tony Ross, all of whom you heard from just a moment ago. Also speaking were the President of the Senate, Drew Perkins, and Speaker of the House, Steve Harshman. Here are the highlights from their speeches. I spoke a little bit to the Senators earlier today, and we want you to know how good it feels to be home. This is our home. This is where we do the work. This is where when we come here, we feel, we feel humbled because of this building. Many of us have had my mother served here for 16 years uh, as a member of the House of Representatives from Natrona County years ago. And from then until now, this building is a, is a special place. It's a special place where we come and spend time away to try and do the work of the people, to try and represent here, you here, to try and carry out your wishes and to help run government so that it, it uh, can help or at least sometimes doesn't get in your way. And so we want you to know we appreciate that. The other thing, I, the only the other thing I would say this morning, this afternoon is, to the, again, to the people of Wyoming, thank you. It is such an honor and a privilege to represent you here in this capacity. And also to remember that we were talking about this earlier, that what happens in this building, who does it, and who occupies these seats, whether you're the governor, or whether you're a senator or representative, it doesn't matter because no one, in a few years, very few people remember that you ever served here. But what we do here is important because it affects you and your lives directly. It affects the education of your children. It affects the roads you drive on, the businesses that you work in. And so we just want you to know that we take that seriously. It's an honor to be back in this house, and, we're, and, and we want to know that we appreciate it and recognize it as an honor and the humbling honor that it is. So again, this is a project about every 100 years or so, somebody else is going to have to stand here and say, yeah, we did it. It's going to happen, and we took some flack over it and all that stuff, but at some point, we saved money, we didn't borrow any money, we paid cash, and we came in on time and on budget. So simply put, really, this is about, it was our turn. We didn't know that when we were born, right? But somehow, Providence put us here at this time to do this work, it had to be done, and we tried to do it right, like our predecessors. And we're going to leave a beautiful, functional capital. It's going to serve the people of this state well. This is the anvil of democracy. This is where it all happens. And this is really this, this gift from our founders. So as we cut the ribbon today, we'll have all the elected officials come up here. I was told I'm supposed to count, Governor. One, two, three, and then we're going to cut. And then we're going to get out of the way. And the elected officials will come off the steps and we want the people swarm the place until the fire marshal says no more. <laughs> and then we're going to be open till 8 tonight. So keep coming back, wandering, go in and sit in the speaker's chair and have your picture taken. Have your son or daughter there. They can be speaker of the house. So again, when you walk in these doors, look up now. You're going to see the four sisters. Right, that represent the values of this state. You're going to see truth holding that lamp that brings the pioneers here, or oh, there was nothing. And then justice, the next sister, right, with her sword, so we can live in peace and have freedom. And then certainly courage to get us through the ups and the downs, and that's what we do in Wyoming. And then the youngest sister, hope, right, that inspires us to always look to the horizon. The sun is going to come up. Wyoming's best days are always ahead. Starley Talbot and Linda Grace Fabian spent a long statehood day autographing their new book, The History of the Wyoming Capitol in the State Museum. Just before the fireworks put an explanation point on that special day, we sat down with Starley Talbot and Wyoming historian Rick Ewig and reflected on the book and the Capitol celebration. 
And as we continue to learn more about Wyoming's capital, it's our pleasure to be joined by an author who has now written a book, The History of A History of the Wyoming Capital. Starley Talbot, welcome to the Wyoming Chronicle. Thank and Rick you. Ewig, you've written a foreword to the book. Mm -hmm. and, and I appreciate your being with us here tonight as well. Glad to. And I want to start with you, Rick, if uh, I could. You wrote that it's essentially a good time for this book to have been written. Well, and I would say it's about time that it should have been written as well. There's never been uh, a book like this written about the Capitol, and since we've just gone through what, three, four years of restoration, this seems certainly like the time uh, that it should have been done. And Starley, you're author of several other books, Wyoming's Airmail Pioneers, Fort Laramie, Cheyenne Frontier Days. Why this book? <laughs> Well, to begin with, uh, we've always marketed our books over at the State Museum. And there, the lady who used to run it, Beth, she kept saying for a couple of years, you need to write a book about the Capitol. Well, then when we heard about the renovation, we thought, ah, then now is the time to do it. So we did. And I've always loved. I love Wyoming history. I love history and love the Capitol. Before we get into the book, I want to tell our viewers we're filming this on Statehood Day. The day that Wyoming's capital was um, celebrated again and reopened with a ribbon cutting and a great ceremony. Rick, let me start with you. What are your thoughts today about what's, what's occurred here in Cheyenne? Well, um, I, I am filled with pride, I guess, that um, for the most important building in the state of Wyoming, this restoration has happened. And to be able, like everybody did, to take it back to when it was first constructed is really something special. I should let our viewers know, Rick, your, your um, um, title. It's something I neglected to do just a moment ago. You're the past associate director of the American Heritage Center, and you're currently vice president of the Wyoming Historical Association and editor of the Annals of, of Wyoming. Mm -hmm. Starley, what about you? What are your thoughts today? Uh, it's just wonderful and almost overwhelming. And I haven't seen the finished project yet because I've been over at the museum signing books all day long, and it's just been wonderful. And, and what's the reception comments. to your book? How, oh, how's it been? It's been wonderful. I think we've signed at least 200 copies, and the people are just so excited. And the people who did go through the, the Capitol are coming back and saying, oh, it's wonderful. So I'm excited to go and see it soon. <laughs> sure, um, and I'm sure you'll get a chance now that it's open. Let's talk about your book, if, if I could a little bit. You, um, um, it's not really just a book about the capital, and we'll get to that, but you start, your chapter one is A Dream Rises from the High Plains. Take us back to the late 1800s. Well, that's hard for me to do because I wasn't here. <laughs> but I think it was a dream, you know. It, Wyoming had such a low population, basically, and they weren't sure they would be able to get statehood. They had to really fight for statehood. So it was really a dream to have their own capital and become a part of the Union as the 44th state. And Rick, you've contemplated Wyoming's history too today. Yes. Um, knowing you know the history of Wyoming at that time and the history of Cheyenne, uh, you know, they were looking towards statehood. Already by the 1860s, people are talking about Wyoming becoming a state. And is this with Territorial Governor Warren, or even before then, or? Oh, it was prior to that. It was always a hope that the territory of Wyoming will become a state. And, and so, you know, we have a lot of people back then, like Francis E. Warren and Joseph M. Carey, who were instrumental in doing that. And you got to research this. How difficult was it for you to really understand Starley, what happened in the late 1800s and how this capital came to be? Well, there is some very good uh, papers that people have written, research papers, and the archives has wonderful materials. And it's just great to know there are old photos, which was amazing that we could find the old photos. So actually, it was time consuming, but there's a lot of information out there. So that was good. Chapter two, and it was touched on today in the speeches that we heard, the lonely supervisor yes. came from Ohio. Give yes. us a little hint about what chapter two is about. Oh, uh, John Fike. I just love, uh, that's actually probably almost my favorite chapter. The letters that he wrote are just, they describe the climate and the people, and it's just perfect. It's like painting a picture. He didn't even need a picture. He painted a beautiful picture. He arrived on a day that was very different <laughs> yes. than today, we heard. Yes, yes. And he said, you know, the wind was blowing and he had to wear a headband to keep it, 
from blowing away. And it was just interesting because he had left his newly married bride at home in Ohio, so he was writing all these letters to her. And there's just wonderful things in there about, I haven't laundered, done my laundry in a month, and I, um, you don't need to worry about me because I haven't seen a pretty girl yet. <laughs> <laughs> so I love the letters. Well, the cowboys. Right? Yeah, and the cowboys, that he, yeah. that he discovered. But he came and to like he Wyoming. He came to love Wyoming, yeah. I believe, yeah. Yeah. And he almost wanted to stay here, but they did end up going back, back to Ohio. And in, I don't know if you're going to ask me, but some of the Fike family were in attendance today, and I was able to meet them, so that was wonderful. It was very neat that the speakers pointed, pointed them out for their company that's still a going concern yes, today, yes. Which, which is just wonderful is, to, yeah. to understand that. And history. Jay actually brought the letters, and Rick knows more about that than I do, but they found the letters and brought them to the archives. When I worked for the state, um, in, in the 1980s, and they knew the centennial of the Capitol was coming up, they were uh, generous enough to donate their materials to the, what is today the State Archives. And so that's how Wyoming received the letters. They are so descriptive. And I know yes. that people who read your books, Starley, <laughs> they'll take themselves back to a time um, here in Cheyenne that you can, you can understand and you can believe, I think. You pay, it paints a very good picture. It painted a wonderful picture. I, I just love those letters. <laughs> and much like today then, Chapter 3, the people celebrate. And they think they had quite a celebration. Yeah, it sounded wonderful. 5,000 people, barbecues. The barbecue. The barbecue. <laughs> yeah, with tables that were, they had trouble figuring out how were they, they were going to make the tables. You talk about that yeah. in the book. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, cornerstone pickles, that was important. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Then you get on to a little more than the capital in your book. You talk about governors, including territorial governors, yes. um, legislators and other leaders in Wyoming, other important women too. Was that a, a tough list for you to kind of narrow down to include in the book? It was, it was difficult. Of course, the more prominent governors were not so easy to, or they were easy to pick out, I'm sorry. And uh, of course, I wanted to emphasize the women's roles, which is very important. And I learned new things about Nellie Taylor Ross, which was very interesting. That, you know, we know she was the first governor of the state and the nation, and we know she worked for the U.S. Mint. But when she was not reelected for uh, another term as governor, she gave speeches on the Chautauqua circuit, and she wrote magazine articles for good housekeeping. How wonderful. I did not know all those details about her before. So, Rick, do you have a favorite w women or, or two maybe in Wyoming's history that you'd like to think about? Well, one is, is who uh, Sally just talked about, Nellie Taylor Ross. And as I understand, there was a member of her yeah. family mm -hmm. in attendance today, which, which was really great. And I've worked with some of the Ross family, and uh, Starley's absolutely right about what she did after she was governor. And in fact, what she was doing was touring the country and, and giving a speech about her time as the first woman governor in the country, and apparently very well received. Mm -hmm. And her good housekeeping, of course, where else at that time would a woman governor have articles published? <laughs> of course, in good housekeeping, go. not in Time or Newsweek, <laughs> but, but in good housekeeping. And they are fascinating. And um, the fact that she went on to a long career in Washington, D.C., she owned a farm out, outside of D.C. in Maryland, and, and, um, and her family uh, just loves the history of Nellie so much. You mentioned Thyra Thompson, Estelle Real, Harriet Elizabeth Byrd, the first black member, uh, black woman to be elected to the Wyoming legislature. Wonderful to read the biographies that you put together. So on to chapter five, statues, art, and symbols. You talk about Esther, Ho Esther Hobart Morris's statue, Chief yes. Wesky's statue. Yes. They're just iconic statues and they were always in front of the Capitol, <laughs> now they're not. And they'll be moved, they'll be in the Capitol connector now, yes, as I understand. Yes, I believe Is so. that right? That's what I understand, yes. So they were important people, even though there's been, you know, some controversy over 
the roles that they played. But. And you talk about that a little bit. Yes. Well, I guess uh, the favorite statue would be Esther, and, and just because of, of that historical controversy mm -hmm. to a degree, and, and um, you know, that statue came about in, in the 1950s. It was um, Lester Hunt who came up with the idea. When he heard that Wyoming didn't have anybody in Statuary Hall, he said, we need somebody, and he's the one who came up with Esther's name. And then it was April 1960 when there was an event at the Capitol building in Washington, D.C. And Nellie Taylor Ross was there to give a speech. Um, Senator Gail McGee, Vice President Nixon, all there were to give a speech about the importance of an Esther statue. On to the last chapter in the book, changes to the Capitol Square. But this will have a major impact on the way government functions. Don't you agree, Rick? Well, I think it certainly will. and and. Um, you know, the people who planned it really were smart and to understand the need for these larger meeting rooms so that more people can attend the meetings of these various committees. And so they're hoping that this really will become probably even more of a people's house and that more people will come and not only enjoy uh, the building itself, but also be able to participate more. From what you know so far, if I had to put you on the spot and say your favorite place in the new capital, could you answer that question for me, Starley? Well, Years ago, I went to rural school in uh, rural Laramie County, so we would come to Cheyenne fairly frequently, and we would get to come to the Capitol and climb clear up to the dome and look out those little tiny windows. And I'm looking I just, up now. Yeah, I love that, and, and I guess that's still my favorite place. <laughs> Rick, how about you? Well, I, th I think the one that I'm, I like the most okay. is the room uh, that w was where the Constitutional Convention sure. met. And that was then later on divided into two floors even. Who made that decision? Right. <laughs> who, who made it <laughs> is the question. So to be able to bring that back. And of course, that's where they talked about suffrage. And that's why the building is on the National Historic Landmark. And so that is such an important part of this. And I agree with that, too. <laughs> well, I'm sure you would encourage everyone to come down and take it. Absolutely. Starley, it's a great book. And, it, and congratulations for writing it. Thank you. And I'm glad that you've already considered it a great success, as, as we have, too. Rick, thank you so much for joining My us pleasure. on Wyoming Chronicle. Funding for this program was provided by the members of the Wyoming PBS Foundation. Thank you for your support.